Hello, and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll profile a unique individual from Lake Winnipeg. But first, joining me now is the executive director of the Fargo Theater, Emily Beck. Uh, Emily, thanks for joining us oh, today. My pleasure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> As we get started, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background, where you're originally from. Absolutely. Um, I was born in Fargo, lived here for um, the first few years of my life. Um, when I was young, uh, my family moved to Valley City, North Dakota. So I spent most of my years growing up there. Um, but Fargo was always kind of home to me as well. My mother was um, very kind to let me uh, come during the summers to attend Trollwood Performing Arts School here in Fargo. And that was a big formative experience for me when I was young. Um, after graduating from Valley City High School, I moved to Moorhead to attend MSUM in the Film Studies Department. Um, and I was fortunate enough to study under, under Rusty Castleton and Tom Brando mm -hmm. there. And I graduated with a degree in film history and criticism. Um, for a while, I worked um, in, with the Marcus Corporation out at West Acres 14. And um, while I was working there, I, uh, I wrote Margie Bailey, the executive director at the time of the Fargo Theater, a letter saying, it would absolutely be my dream someday to come work at the Fargo Theater. Please consider me when there's an opening. Mm. A few months later, <laughs> there was in fact an opening at the Fargo Theater. I reapplied. She happened to remember my letter. And I started on board at the Fargo Theater as the film programmer. Um, a position that I held for just about three years. Okay. Well, you kind of got my next question, is how oh. you became executive director. Oh. You answered that. <laughs> but, you know, so uh, the transition, and you're, you're relatively new on the job. I am, so, yes, uh, just uh, a when, few when, Okay. T uh, you started June or July, is that right? Yeah, just the end of June is when I, we really uh, finished the transition. Um, but Margie had had me under her wing for, she had she'd kind of had this in her head for a while. Um, so she had been uh, taking me in piece by piece, introducing me to people, teaching me things that she had been doing throughout the year. Um, and then, yeah, we finished up in the end of July or the end of June, and it's been it's been great so far. We'll talk more about the transition because uh, not only you're taking over a, Far a Fargo icon, you're sort of replacing one. Margie Bailey's uh, done a lot for the theater. Uh, talk about that transition and and the challenges you've had here early on in your job. Absolutely. You know, I think the biggest challenge is that I have some big shoes to fill. Uh, Margie is absolutely just beloved in this community, and she has done so much to move the theater forward. Um, she was a co-founder of the festival. She, um, she helped with the downtown renaissance, and she really saw the second screen through um, its completion. So she was just this pioneering, incredible little firecracker of a woman, and that is, those are some big shoes to fill. But she was very good. She, she taught me a lot. We, she really took the time to nurture me, to nurture this transition. Um, so honestly, so far, it's been pretty smooth. Now, is she still around and still active or? Oh, absolutely, <laughs> yep. <Yeah. laughs> She'll still be functioning as a film festival volunteer and she has definitely made herself available to me whenever I need her. It's been great. I can, I can pick up the phone. Even She even gave me her coveted lake <laughs> house number so I can pick up the phone and give her a call out there if I need her. Oh, that's good. Yeah, talk about the theater itself. Uh, so, sort of what are the challenges ahead as you see it now? Absolutely. Well, you know, the Fargo Theater is a nonprofit organization, and all of the nonprofits, particularly in the arts sector, uh, were struggling for fundraising. Um, so that is always a challenge for us. But another unique challenge for us for the Fargo Theater is a uh, digital transition. Mm. Um, movie theaters all over the country are converting to digital projection. So um, that's kind of looming over us is we'll have to do that in the next couple of years or so. We'll have to do some serious fundraising um, to make that possible for both of our theaters. Okay, so digital, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, here at Prairie <laughs> Public, we've gone through the digital transitional phases. Uh, yeah, I hadn't even thought about uh, what movie theaters are having to go through with the digital part. Because is that an expensive process then? Absolutely. It could be between eighty to 100000 per screen and box office receipts nationally are down, so it's just kind of a, a difficult time to make that transition, but it's necessary, okay. absolutely. Well, let's talk some, uh, for the people who may not know about the Fargo Theater, because obviously as we sit uh, not too far away from it, yeah. a lot of folks uh, in the region may know, and but may not know. Uh, talk about what kind of entertainment you have and what you specialize in. Absolutely. Well, the Fargo Theater was founded in 1926, so this was our 85th birthday. And it's kind of incredible that we've been in operation ever since. We've been a movie house, a cinema, mm -hmm. and it was started as a vaudeville theater as well. So there has always been live entertainment on the stage. And that's what we continue to do today. Uh, we are Fargo Moorhead's Art House Theater. 
So we show foreign films, independent films, films that might not normally have a chance to be screened theatrically in this area because, you know, they're not huge blockbusters. Maybe they don't have an all-star cast, um, that kind of thing, but they're, there's something really valuable about that kind of um, outside-of-the-box thinking and that really creative um, type of filmmaking. So we're very pleased to show that. And of course, live entertainment is a huge part of what we do as well. Okay. Well, with that said, uh, can you talk a bit about some of the film product uh, you know that that you normally offer? I guess at the theater, and sometimes it's sort of a a, a crapshoot. I guess is what I'll say here as to what films do well financially and which ones don't. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, you can never predict with any yeah. complete assurance what's going to hit and what's not. Um, for instance, um, we kind of knew Paranormal Activity would be big. It had some buzz behind it, but we never could have predicted it would have been as big as it was. Um, so whenever anything like that comes around, we feel very fortunate. Um, that's been a lot of fun. Things like that, things like My Big Frat Greek Wedding or Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, once in a while, an independent or a foreign film will come along and it'll just really connect with audiences. And that's always fun to watch that happen. Um, but the smaller films, you know, the ones that don't rake in $100 million, um, those are still excellent to share with this community because they all have something to say. So. Yeah. With that said, uh, booking films is sort of an odd business. And can you talk any about how you get films and, and, and do that? Absolutely. Um, well, the independent films, they don't open wide, which means they don't open on 4,000 screens across the country on one day. Um, the distributor will probably make uh, 40 to 50 prints, depending on the film. And those will start out in the large cities, and they'll watch the performance, and then it'll basically trickle down to the different markets. So um, in Fargo, one of the best things we can do is watch what's playing in the other hard to host theaters around the country, um, New York and LA in particular, and then Chicago. We watch what performs there, and um, we kind of scheme to bring those into the Fargo. Well, because I, I know Fargo Theater, you're, you're a nonprofit, as you mentioned, and, and of course your mission's different, and you don't compete for the blockbusters, I don't believe, but I mean, Iron Man, made it into your theater, <laughs> but so, I mean, opportunities just come up or? Uh... Oh, absolutely, and we take them when they do, you know? <laughs> um, the Fargo Theater uh, used to play blockbusters all the time. Um, Star Wars played there, mm -hmm. um, and so there's also a history of playing mainstream popular films, and we embrace those as well. We, we welcome all sorts there, so we're certainly not gonna turn away something like Iron Man 2. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, what about during the seasons, do you see ebbs and flows in uh, in people coming because uh, you know maybe you have a great film that you think is going to do good but is it just the wrong season for it that absolutely happens um the summer typically although this last summer was a bit of an exception to that rule summer can be pretty slow for us because summer is the time of mm -hmm. the big popcorn blockbuster movie everyone's heading to the multiplexes to see the next transformers film or something like that so summer can be pretty slow for the art house theaters um but then typically winter right around um, oscar season award season we can really start to pick up, so that's fun to watch. Okay, Let, let's talk some about the live entertainment at the theater. Uh, can you talk some about the variety? And because I mean, as you said, there's a stage up there, and mm -hmm. I was recently there for a hunger event that you had. Uh, and can you talk about some of the things that you have at the theater? Absolutely. Um, we're fortunate enough to have a great partnership with Jade Presents, um, the local promotion company, um, and they bring in all sorts of fantastic musicians, um, Jewel, Ani DeFranco, things like that. Things that really, um, artists that really work well in a more intimate environment, um, especially acoustic music. Um, so Jade Presents is always bringing in a wonderful catalog of, of musicians. They also Recently, um, stand-up comics have been huge at the Fargo Theater, and that's been fun to watch. We really enjoy having comedians in as well. And then besides that, um, we are happy to host a local groups such as the FM Symphony, um, the FM Opera will be doing um, their Christmas show at the Fargo Theater again this year, so we're also fortunate enough to give them a home for things like that. Okay. Uh, you mentioned the second theater uh, earlier. And I know that was a dream of Margie's to finally uh, to get that, and, and it did come to fruition. Can you talk some about the second theater and, again, maybe explain uh, how it works into the operation and what it means to the Fargo Theater? That second theater has just been incredible for us as far as programming goes. It has just thrown the doors wide open for us. Um, something like Paranormal Activity or Iron Man 2 never would have been able to play at the Fargo Theater without that second screen. Um, what it allows us to do is it allows us to play films uninterrupted, which is a very important thing to a distributor. Um, you'll be able to show that film every single night a certain number of times. 
Um, so when we have a concert in the large theater and we've got a packed house there, there can be wonderful music going on in there, we can continue to play our films in the second screen. Um, and we show films in there every day of the year. Uh, again, uh, how many people can you seat in the main theater and then in the second theater? Uh, the large theater seats 870. With the balcony. With the balcony, mm -hmm. yep. And the small theater seats 76. Okay. So it's a much different environment. Um, and it's great. You find the films that just fit in there. You know, the films where you just want that more intimate environment and it's, it's just perfect. And some films, you know, they're grand or they're majestic and they just fit perfectly in the large theater, so. Okay. Well, I, I know a subject near and dear to the heart of one of our producers of this show and one of our producers here at Prairie Public, Matt O'Lean, uh, enjoys the Fargo Film Festival, um, I believe entering its 12th year now. Uh, can you talk about how the festival has grown and, and sort of maybe, do you have any, is it too early for talk about March? But. Yeah, I don't think we have, we don't have too much locked in stone right now, but submissions are definitely pouring in, um, and the jurying will take place um, at the end of the year and then a little bit into January as well. Um, but the festival was started by just a handful of people who were really passionate about film, um, Margie Bailey being one of them, and I know Matt's been there since day one, and he's just an incredibly valuable asset to the film festival. Um, just people who, who saw the value of a film festival, what that can bring to the community, these really independent voices, celebrating these independent filmmakers who are working, I don't know, out of their basements in Omaha, but who are you know, creating these fantastic, important films that should be seen by this community. So um, they got together and they founded this film festival. It started out um, almost 12 years ago now with 30 entries. Um, and this year, uh, this last year, we uh, went to almost 150. So there has been some substantial growth. Mm -hmm. And that's not always the case for film festivals in smaller communities. So we're pretty fortunate we had a lot of driving force behind it to keep it here. Uh, and with that, uh, obviously, you're, you're new. <laughs> You've been there just a few months now. Do, do you see this continuing under your leadership? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yep, absolutely. I love the film festival. I feel very passionately about keeping it, keeping it going, growing it, seeing where it can go. Okay. Well, now, let's talk about sort of the explosion of the downtown Fargo area. Uh, I mean, you've been around long enough to, I mean, it's changed quite a bit in the last, well, few years. You, I mean, even five or ten for that matter, but it's changed a lot. And how has that impacted the downtown area and, and for the Fargo Theater itself? Oh, it's just been incredible. Um, I moved here ten years ago to start at MSUM, and it has been so much fun to watch uh, the downtown community just blossom, all these little shops, great restaurants, and it's certainly been beneficial um, to the theater. We just get more foot traffic downtown. Um, people feel more comfortable coming downtown. Um, they can make a night out of it. They can come see a great movie at the Fargo Theater and then go have a cocktail at the Hodo. It's, it's a great night out and it has been wonderful for the theater. Hmm. Well, let's talk, we mentioned a little bit, but let's talk about the funding uh, for the Fargo Theater. Uh, can, can you give us a breakdown of what makes up the funding? Absolutely. Um, of course, you know, our, our film revenue certainly helps, um, but, uh, you know, membership and donations and grants are a crucial uh, element in our budget every single year. Um, we rely on those donations and those membership purchases to keep our doors open. Um, you know, we're a nonprofit arts organization, but we're also managing a historic facility. So it's kind of twofold, and um, keeping up with that facility is also, you know, it's, it's, it's a costly endeavor, but... Um, Thankfully, this community has supported the theater time and time again. So we're able to keep going, keep offering the great programming that we have, and look forward to the future. Mm -hmm. With that said, uh, you're the executive director, but can you talk about the staffing there? How many, how many staff do you have? Well, uh, there's just two of us full time. Mm -hmm. um, it's just Sean Volk is our operations manager. He's an incredibly devoted young man. Um, so the two of us are there full time. And then we have uh, 10 part time employees. Um, we have a finance manager. And then we have a variety of concession workers, projectionists, and technical crew. Okay. What about the volunteers for an organization like the Fargo Theater? How important are they and how many do you have each year? Oh, wow. Um, we have over 100 volunteers that work with the theater on an annual basis. Um, for instance, our head usher is a man named Steve Tullifson, and he, <laughs> he contributes um, a countless amount of hours to us. He's there at every single live event helping us um, with the flow of traffic. Um, so Steve's an incredible volunteer, and he's just one of 100. Um, the film festival is, is manned by volunteers. 
um, in conjunction with theater staff. But it's really, it's a volunteer-driven festival. Um, our board of directors, of course, they're volunteers, um, and they're incredibly dedicated. They help us with fundraising, with event planning, um, with all sorts of things. So the Fargo Theater is definitely, definitely volunteer-driven. Well, when, with that said, uh, for, again, I know we think about it, and we you hear there all the time. I'm there every <laughs> once in a while. And we see it and we understand and visualize it, but I'm trying to set the picture for people who've never been in there. This theater has been renovated into what would be an old-fashioned theater that they used to go to, but even with the Wurlitzer that comes up and is played most nights before shows. Can you talk about that? Absolutely. Um, the theater in 1998 and 99, um, the theater underwent um, an eight-month renovation restoration project and they got it back to its 1937 Art mm -hmm. Deco design. So it is just an incredible Art Deco uh, movie palace and you walk in and you just you feel the atmosphere immediately. And then on weekends, like you mentioned, um, the Mighty Wurlitzer, the four-manual theater pipe organ, is still played um, with a prelude before the films and then also on an annual basis, uh, Silent Movie Night happens, which is also a lot of fun. Silent Movie Night, um, you know, a silent comedy is, is shown on the big screen and there is a live and original score on the organ, which is a pretty unique experience. So it's a lot of fun. Well, it is. And uh, for anybody who's never been there, they sh should think about stopping by sometime. I, you, know, you mentioned you went to MSUM, the Film Studies uh, uh, program. Can you kind of talk about that program a little bit? Uh, you, you mentioned Rusty and, and others. But talk about uh, the different uh, things that it helped get you ready for you know, being in the business you're in. Oh, absolutely. It was a tremendous amount of help. Um, with Rusty, I, I studied box office trends, which to me is a fantastic, it's a very interesting subject. I, I love um, learning about what has been popular in film throughout the years and seeing how that kind of reflects on what's going on in society at the time. Um, so my thesis was on box office trends, and that has just been hugely instrumental in helping me program the films at the Fargo Theater. Um, in some ways, it definitely helped spot paranormal activity from a few months away. Um, in August, we were recording the film. So um, that education gave me a great foundation for what I'm doing now. Um, and also with the film festival, mm -hmm. I learned about the inner workings of a film festival at MSUM. So I, I went into this job not completely blind, which is very helpful. <laughs> What are your goals for the future for the Fargo Theater? I want to keep it going. Um, I want to do what we're doing, do it even better, keep things um, growing and expanding. I want to see the film festival expanded maybe even a few more days. Right now it's at five. I'd love to see it at seven with even more programming, more special guests, um, more unique, wonderful little independent films. Um, we've already expanded our classic film series. Um, classic films are definitely near and dear to my heart. Um, and so we took that program from one week in August and now we'll be running one classic film every month of the year. So it's things like that that I want to keep working on, keep expanding as we move forward. And Margie's been great helping me with that as well. You know, as you came out of school and you talked about uh, working other places briefly, but uh, it sounds like you could imagine that you want, because you wanted to be in this job. I did. <laughs> I absolutely, well, I didn't know I wanted to be executive director, <laughs> um, but I knew I wanted to work at the Fargo Theater. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. uh, well, so, okay, if people want more information, uh, what's the best place, for, where's the best place for them to go? Our website, www.fargotheater.org, has all of our upcoming film programming, our live events, information about the theater, information about membership. It's all there. Well, Emily, uh, good luck to you, and we wish you the best uh, in your job. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Thanks for joining us today. Stay tuned for more. On the banks of Lake Winnipeg, Nelson Girard collects and protects photographs from around the world that record Icelandic immigration. He provides these images for exhibitions in North America, and he has helped produce an exhibit on immigration for a museum in Iceland. The Immigration Center at Hofsos provides people with information that is not readily available anywhere else. There are three exhibits at Hofsos. The first exhibit was the story of why the immigrants left and their experiences during the first years. I think it's called New Land, New Life. 
The second exhibit focuses on the Icelandic settlement in North Dakota and again explores that with pictures and stories and first-hand experiences. And the third exhibit is one called Silent Flashes, which is the newest. It was set up in 2004. And that exhibit really came about through a long process of collection. Those pictures had been sort of filtering into me uh, at my center here, mostly from people who were just looking to find a good home for their old pictures that didn't mean much to them anymore. The uh, Silent Flashes exhibit covers the time period from 1870 to 1910 approximately and is a selection of photographs that represent basically the immigrant experience in North America. The process of selecting the photographs was actually very difficult, not because there were so few, but because there were so many. The Silent Flashes exhibit uh, actually consists of more than 400 photographs some very large, some rather small in the presentation. The categories of photographs came out of an attempt to bring some order to this mass collection of, of photographic work. Subject matter became the obvious way. Pictures of babies, pictures of newlyweds, pictures of families, pictures of elderly pioneers who had sort of weathered the storm. They are incredible photographs. The caliber of photography during the 1880s and 90s was really surprising. Of the 16 photographers uh, featured in the exhibit uh, at Hofsos, probably the most important one is Jon Blundell, who was a Winnipeg photographer. He became a, a little bit of a hero in the story of photography and the pioneers in that um, he made a real effort to travel out to the settlements and to capture images of many of the pioneer families. When I built this home in 1988-89, I actually established it as the Aderbaki Icelandic Heritage Center. The um, archive I have upstairs has one of the largest collections of genealogical material about things Icelandic here in North America. The only place that the microfilm of the Icelandic ministerial records exists in North America, apart from Salt Lake City, is here. Well, I grew up as a farm boy uh, in western Manitoba with the soil of Manitoba under my fingernails, so no no Icelandic uh, input there really, but my mother did always have a few stories and we had little remnants of culture like the, the cooking and uh, the odd custom like opening our gifts on Christmas Eve and we always knew of this connection and of course people like to be related to famous people so we heard that we were related to the explorer Wilhelmer Stephenson and that we were descended from a bishop back in Iceland. And these were things that sort of fired the imagination of a, of a prairie boy. I remember sitting down at the kitchen table with my mother and a big piece of paper. And um, just from her knowledge, uh, we drew up a family tree. The Department of Icelandic had been established at the University of Manitoba in 1951. There I was able to, uh, again, connect with the information about Iceland, about the culture, about the history, etc. And from there it was three years at the University of Iceland. Learned the ropes of doing genealogy at the National Archives and um, came back to Canada and have been at it ever since. The idea of the, of the exhibit itself uh, was sort of a natural outcome of this collecting process and the opportunity to present those pictures to the public came with the invitation to work at Hofsos. I field a lot of questions and inquiries, uh, both from North Americans and people from Iceland as well. The Icelanders, of course, want to know about their relatives who emigrated and what became of them and what their lives were like, and if they have any relatives in North America and how they can find them. People from North America go to Iceland looking for relatives as well, but they are also looking for their ancestral homesteads. They're also looking for genealogical data that will 
tell them about the past and about their ancestors. There's a, a stigma attached to the emigration and there are different reasons for that, but uh, basically it's not viewed as a positive story so much. It was a very beneficial and necessary thing, and it's something that the Emigration Centre helps to educate everybody about. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week, and as always, thanks for watching.